Coming up, the challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act. Indigenous people break celestial barriers and the chair of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. I am Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Amit Awahopa, thank you for joining us. We start our newscast 260 miles above planet Earth at the International Space Station. Earlier this week, NASA astronaut Nicole Mann shared her experience living in space so far. At a press conference, which was organized by the Associated Press, Mann answered a question from our news organization. Our first question is from ICT, formerly Indian Country Today. What goes through your mind when you look at Mother Earth? Oh, there are so many things that go through my mind. It is an absolutely incredible experience. I thought about it a lot before launch and wondered what it was going to feel like. And it's difficult to explain because the emotions are absolutely overwhelming. It is an incredible scene of color of clouds and land, and it's difficult not to stay in the cupola all day and just see our planet Earth and how beautiful she is and how delicate and fragile she is against the blackest of black that I've ever seen, space in the background. The Round Valley Indian tribe citizen made history in early October as the first Native woman in space. Most of the questions were submitted by Native media, including Native News Online and the Navajo Times. Mann unveiled the dream catcher she took to space, saying she keeps it in her crew quarters but brought it out especially for the interview. She also had a message for the students from her community who watched her launch into space. I appreciate all of their good energy. Please know that I carry your hopes and your dreams with me to the International Space Station. And I hope for you that you will be able to achieve your dreams. And I pass along the energy for you to persevere in your childhood to do everything that you aspire to do in life. And we'll have more on Nicole Mann's mission later in our newscast. Now to California, where the Redding Rancheria held its State of the Tribe event last week. Tribal citizens gathered at the tribe's Wind River Casino for food, stories, music, and gathering. The nation's leaders used their speeches to highlight progress made by the tribe within the last two years. Speakers at the event also highlighted the role of elders in the community, as well as the history of their tribe's relocation story. The event by the Redding Rancheria has been happening for over 20 years. In Canada, First Nations man says he'll use the Constitution to prove he can sell cannabis within his tribe's territory. APTN's Angel Moore has the story. 30 people gathered in front of the Dartmouth Provincial Court to support Chris Gugu of the Millbrook First Nation. At the end of the day, our nation, like our, our uh, nation, like uh, we're stronger than any province or anything, you know, like that when our people come together, it's a force to be reckoned with. Gugu is fighting cannabis charges based on constitutional grounds. Like exercising our inherent and treaty rights is like something that uh, like all of our people should be doing freely and not have to be harassed by any bodies of governments. Gugu's cannabis store is located on land that is part of Millbrook. Last December, the Halifax RCMP's Street Crime Unit raided it and four other unlicensed shops and charged Gugu with the illegal possession and selling of cannabis. One supporter is Del Riley, is the former head of the National Indian Brotherhood, the forerunner of the Assembly of First Nations. 
author of Section 35 of Canada's Constitution, which recognizes and affirms treaty rights. The nations here have a wonderful, they're in a wonderful position in terms of the fact that all of their rights are totally intact in all of the land here. I know I'm on their land right here because nobody bought it from them. Chief Bob Glode of the Millbrook First Nation supports Gugu and says Millbrook is in the process of developing their own cannabis regulations. And our community will decide as a, as a collective under our, under our rights how it's going to appear and, and operate and, and exist within our community. Gugu says selling goods on traditional land is his treaty right. We never lost our lands in a war. We never sold our lands. We didn't make an agreement for our lands. As far as I'm concerned, I'm standing on my unceded Mi'kmaq territory, and like I should be able to do exercise any of my rights. Gugu's lawyer, Jack Lloyd, plans to use selling cannabis as a treaty right protected by the Constitution as a defense. A Nova Scotia court will decide whether that argument is valid next October, with trial on the charges set to go the following month. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Cole Harbour, Nova Scotia. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The U.S. Supreme Court will hear the case Brackeen v. Holland in November. It challenges the 1978 Indian Child Welfare Act, which protects Native children if they are removed from their families, tribes, and nations. Sarah Deer is a professor at the University of Kansas and is the Chief Justice for the Prairie Island Indian Communities Court of Appeals. Well, ICWA requires that state courts that are removing children from Indian parents um, for any reason whatsoever and placed out of home, um, tribal nations um, are informed about that change in custody uh, and have a chance to weigh in on the placement of that child. Um, the case involves white couples who wanted to adopt Indigenous children, but didn't want to go through the tribal court process. The adoption industry is against the law. It's a very, very wealthy industry. Um, adoptive parents, um, a white, particularly white adoptive parents, are opposed to ICWA because they see it as a barrier for, for adopting Indian children. Um, the challenge is a constitutional one. There's something called the 14th Amendment that talks about equal protection. And equal protection applies to racial classification. So the government cannot allow discrimination if you're Black or Latino. Um, but the question here is, are tribes and tribal people a racial classification or a political classification? And if it's the latter, then equal will be upheld. The hearing is set the day after the midterm election. Well, November 9th is also my 50th birthday, so I'm approaching it with some trepidation. Um, but I do think that um, it is a political move. I can't say if the timing of the oral arguments was specifically set um, because of the midterms, but I do think that the, um, the oral arguments, we didn't even know if the court would be back in person in session because they've been you know, had COVID protocols for so, so long. Um, but they are going to allow people to attend these oral hearings in person if they so choose. You can also listen to them online. Deer says the makeup of the court is something to think about. Well, I think it's become politicized. And so to the extent that you can differentiate between conservative justices and more liberal justices, um, the conservative wing of the court is certainly um, outweighed by the liberal um, justices. Um, I'm excited to see what she'll have to say about Indian law, but I also think it's important for us to understand that we have two adoptive parents on the court, um, that being Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. And to the extent that they understand these arguments as somehow denigrating adoptive parents, which is not the argument at all, uh, they may feel personally uh, invested in the outcome um, in a way that maybe other justices wouldn't. So all of the briefs that have been filed have been designed um, so that it's not about bad adoptive parents or bad foster parents. It's about tribal sovereignty. It has become known as the 60s scoop in Canada, which was the mass removal of Native children from their homes, community, and culture. An estimated 30,000 Native children were adopted or fostered to mostly white middle-class homes in Canada. Colleen Rajat spoke to some of the survivors. 
Cameron Longo was taken from his birth mother in the late 1970s. He was adopted with his two younger biological sisters to a white middle-class home in Winnipeg. Longo says his adoptive white father, a former Christian missionary, severely abused him and his siblings for more than a decade. Because I took jam from our pantry in the basement, strawberry jam, I love it. And uh, mom had canned it. And, um, and so when he found out, uh, he made all of me and my two sisters um, get on our hands and knees and he threw our dinner on the floor and without using our hands we had to eat it like animals he said if you're if you're going to take stuff without asking like animals do then he says you're going to be treated like animals and there's you know other terrible moments you know he put feces on our face for taking a, um, a valentine heart candies on this day he revisits the inner city neighborhood where he was taken away from his biological mother. Cameron grew up in Winnipeg, but thousands of other adoptees were sent to the United States and Europe. The 60s scoop covers a time period between 1951 to 1991. It's estimated 30,000 Indigenous children were taken away from their families, communities and culture. She was just a young woman. She had five kids by the time she was um, 24 and lived with a lot of domestic violence and some, probably some alcoholic addiction as well too. But she loved us. I've never ever doubted that. Cameron never saw his mother again. She passed in 1987 at the age of 33. The settlement amounted to $875 million. 750 million for survivors, 50 million for a healing foundation, and 75 million for lawyers. The federal government made it clear that they were only compensating for loss of language and culture. Oh, it's atrocious. Um, $25,000 for loss of um, culture and language? Like, it's terrible. Cameron received the $25,000 settlement. He says that amounts to about $6 a day for everything he went through. I, I still think that was very, very, very low amount. And when you think of uh, the lawyers just getting so much money for, um, and they didn't suffer. It's, it's just, it's, it's really nothing, you know. It's Christopher really Gatehouse grew up in various abusive foster homes. He says no amount of money will ever compensate him for the abuses he suffered. Like everything that happened to me is still inside of me and it's, it's, it's never going to change. It's always going to feel that way. I'm always going to have this deep sadness inside me. This, like these, this just feeling of just unwantedness, you know. For Longo, some healing has occurred. He says part of his healing process was his adoptive mother acknowledging that he was abused. I didn't need to hear excuses saying I'm a battered wife or I was just following the husband's orders or that's the way we were raised or this or that, but I needed to hear that. In 1990, Cameron's adoptive father eventually served time in jail after being charged with the abuse. Gordon Blue Sky, a 60 Scoop survivor, is the newly elected chief of the Broken Head Ojibwe First Nation in Manitoba. Blue Sky was adopted to Pennsylvania and made it home decades ago. I definitely feel that in my position now I can bring voice to 60 Scoop and our survivors. I find it really disheartening that a settlement would, was happened on our cultural identity and it, it accumulated to $25,000. Um, again, it's not necessarily just about the money, but it's about our people not only feeling awkward in ceremony, awkward in their home community, you know, maybe not being respected the same way as a, as a member that was born here. So they don't understand how it is to feel that way. And I definitely say the Can Canadian government didn't recognize that in the settlement that we had. Longo says he and other adoptees may be able to sue provincial agencies for physical and sexual abuse. For now, he remains hopeful that one day he will see true justice for what happened to him. In Winnipeg, 
Colleen Rajat, ICT News. When Chickasaw citizen John Harrington was in space in 2002, part of his mission was to help build new areas of the International Space Station. Fast forward to this exact moment, and that's where NASA astronaut Nicole Mann is currently living. Harrington, who was the first Native person in space, gives us his unique perspective on this mission. I'm thinking, wow, it's been 20 years. I mean, it's, uh, time has just flown by, and it's great to see an Indo-Native person be able to uh, fly to the space station, be a part of the nation's post, uh, space program, and then hopefully inspire a bunch of Native kids that this is something they can do as well. I met her a while back uh, when she was selected, I think, in 2013. I left the office in 2005. So I look at, you know, you know, if you go back 20 years from when I flew, we just started flying the space shuttle. So, you know, about STS-2, STS-3. So in that 20 year gap, so much stuff has changed. Uh, I'd actually, I called uh, astronaut crew quarters. I spoke to Lauren Lundy. Uh, she worked there when I was there. And I said, hey, pass along to Nicole, you know, best of luck, congratulations. Also Koichi Wakata is a Japanese astronaut that I was in the office when I was there. I call him Koichi the man, you know, he's upstairs as well. So I wished him all well, but I haven't talked to her personally since she was assigned or she, when she's flying. Harrington was at the space station for a couple of weeks. Nicole Mann is scheduled to be there for six months. Well, I say lucky her. I'm very envious. And I would love to have flown on space station. I was training to uh, fly with two Russians. I was a commander, had a medical issue that uh, prevented me from flying long duration, unfortunately. Uh, but to be able to see somebody fly for six months, there's a lot of issues that go along with that. Certainly the challenge of being in space for that long. You know, microgravity has an impact. Uh, on your body. Uh, you lose muscle mass, you lose bone mass. And so you do about two extra two hours of exercise every day, uh, a variety of experiments. The thing about when I flew, you know, I flew for two weeks and, you know, there, there's working in space and there's living in space. And I think the idea of flying for six months uh, is the idea of living in space as well. And I, I would, uh, I, I wish her well. I would love to have done that, but uh, it is what it is, right? Harrington comments on man's mission. I understand that she's scheduled to do spacewalks. I understand she's scheduled to do about 200 experiments during the six months. I mean, the crew is, uh, is expected to do 200 experiments. Uh, she'll have a chance to step outside. And one of the, the best, the high point of my professional career was being able to step outside the vehicle and go out and assemble the vehicle uh, that she's on right now. So I'm really glad I had a part in that. It's a challenge. It's a lot of hard work. You have to stop at some point in your mission and really look and I'm, and I'm appreciate where you are and what you have the opportunity to do on behalf of uh, on behalf of the United States government, your family, and your friends. Perhaps a few of the students who gathered in Palm Springs for the ACES conference dream of being an astronaut. David Knoyer has this report from the American Indian Science and Engineering Society's conference. The land and music of the desert Coahuila people welcomed a record crowd of indigenous scientists, engineers, students, and allies to Palm Springs. There's a ton of people here. I've never seen this many people in one place. It's, it's amazing that I welcome you to the 2022 ACES here in For its 45th annual conference, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, or ACES, had its biggest turnout ever, 2,700 registrants. Science affects us in every single way, biology, chemistry, um, mathematics, engineering. I mean, literally everything in our life is somehow affected by STEM. I received my associates in pre-engineering from Blackfeet Community College. Students are the majority of attendees drawn by the chance to expand their horizons and connect with corporations, colleges, and mentors. Good morning, how are we doing? Welcome to ACES, welcome to Boeing. Conference speakers challenged attendees not just to dream, but to dream bigger in the face of rapid change. If I can see in my lifetime the amount of change that I have seen, I can only imagine uh, what you all will see. ACES leaders are working to improve indigenous representation in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields, similar to trends in the entertainment field. With our on-screen representation of 0.04% of all American film and television, you know, we've ultimately been erased from a lot of American minds. And so that's what, one of the things that really fuels me is to really change those numbers. I've been to other professional societies and sure they're a good time, but there, it's nothing like 
coming to ASUS. I mean, ASUS even touches your heart. It's, it's so meaningful to come here. ASUS honored indigenous professionals for individual achievement and promotion of science in indigenous communities. Dr. Sonia Ibarra has worked hand in hand with Alaska Native communities on research that counters typical academic approaches. To do this transformative change is really hard, and it's also hard work. I mean, my heart. That's why this community is so important, because we are teaching each other how to dream about our futures. ACES gave its highest honor to a tribal college professor who has championed science education for all ages. In Palm Springs, David Knoyer, ICT News. Climate change, rural economics, and language loss are just a handful of issues before the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. The committee chairman is Hawaii senior Senator Brian Schatz. The first thing uh, that I started with is uh, to just listen. Um, you're dealing with uh, lots of individual sovereign nations that have unique trust and treaty responsibilities uh, and relationships with the federal government. And I needed to understand the unique culture, geography, history, um, language status, uh, reservation status. And so I spent a lot of time listening. And what I heard was nothing about me without me, that tribal consultation was essential. And also that as important as it is to pass individual pieces of legislation, the basic problem in Indian country is disinvestment is a lack of investment over many, many decades and really generations. And so we set about on an ambitious program to invest more in Indian country and native communities than the federal government has ever done before. And we did it. Broadband, uh, physical infrastructure, uh, sanitation, healthcare, education. We've invested more in Indian country and native communities in Hawaii and Alaska than the federal government has ever uh, done before. Senator Schatz talks about the importance of tribal consultation. Well, Rosalind So is, uh, is a star, um, and she was just confirmed. Uh, and she's someone who has um, great experience uh, within uh, Indian Health Service. And we think um, she's going to be a real advocate and um, an asset within the administration. And of course, uh, Sec Assistant Secretary uh, Brian, Brian Newland as well uh, has been a friend of Indian country uh, for a long time, someone who I have gotten to know over the last year and a half. And, you know, these issues are not always easy, but he understands the nuance and he also understands uh, the, the importance of tribal consultation. Uh, you know, when people came to me initially and said tribal consultation is important, I, it sort of registered in my brain, but not in, you know, in, in Hawaii, they say it, you know, right here, right in your stomach. Uh, I didn't quite understand the importance of it. And now I do. Now I understand that Tribal consultation isn't just a box to check, it is an attitude. It is an understanding that you are on a parity. Federal government is at parity with the uh, organizations that have a treaty relationship with the United States. And they have to be treated um, as though they matter on the front end. I'm, I'm, um, I watched your uh, new segment about the new national monument and the youths who felt left out. Sure, probably as a matter of compliance with the law, tribal consultation was done, but not really. And so what we're trying to do, whether it's climate action or the Violence Against Women Act or infrastructure investments or broadband deployment, is listen to tribes, listen to Indian country first and let that inform what we ought to do as opposed to formulating a plan and then telling Indian country about it at the end of the process. Tattoos have a long history for Indigenous people. ICT's Pacey Smith-Garcia profiles artists, giving it a modern-day spin. Take a look. Midtown in Phoenix, Arizona, plays host to Desert Bloom, which is an Indigenous-owned and operated tattoo shop. What's special is that the salon features a full team of Indigenous tattoo artists. The establishment was founded by Missy Mahan. It features a 50s aesthetic that is filled with Indigenous art on the walls. Mahan says the idea started for her after she noticed indigenous representation in the area was lacking. Um, it came about just an idea that I had. Um, I was tattooing out of a studio by myself and just kind of came to me to bring more of an indigenous vibe to the shop because you don't see any of those around here in Phoenix. 
Desert Bloom provides tattoos with an endless amount of options. They have even been approached by customers who want a traditional style. Everything we do is custom, so if people do like more of the traditional style tattoos, um, we do that as well. And as far as traditional like tribal tattoos, um, those have now that people know that we are an indigenous owned shop, um, you know, we get a lot of like actual, you know, tribal tattoos, like a lot of the facial tattoos, um, you know, from Southern Arizona. The artists know that many of these markings carry specific meaning. Desert Bloom artist Mello explains what his tattoos from his kids mean. This one tattooed me uh, last month and my youngest tattooed me a couple months ago. So yeah, they tat just tattooed their names on me. And so those are my favorite tattoos, my kids. All of these tattoo artists say in the long run, they hope to inspire a new generation. Absolutely, even now, I'm even on social media, you see I discover a new indigenous artist like every day. So it's amazing to see more and more every day. Phoenix, Arizona, Pacey Smith Garcia, ICT News. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.